right, I think we should get started. I know both of our guest speakers are here already. So um, good morning and thank you all for joining us. I'm Christine Woody. I am the Senior Policy and Organizing Coordinator for Empower Missouri. I help coordinate our um, food security work and our criminal justice reform work. And we are here today to talk about our food security um, work that we're going to be doing um, now and in the future. So thank you all for joining us today on this crazy week. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, let me share my screen. Um, yes, and I actually just got a, a message from Caitlin to see if she could go first. So we'll just switch things around a little bit and let her um, give us a quick update from the department. So let me just share my screen real, real quick. I see Caitlin has a, a guest star. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry to shake things up today. Um, this is Elena and she's not feeling good. So she's uh -huh. home with me. So uh, in the interest of trying to do this without her screaming, I thought I'd try and get it out of the way first. All right, you're totally fine. So um, go ahead. You can go ahead and start Caitlin. Caitlin is our liaison that works with us from the Department of Social Services. Um, she is so wonderful and joins us pretty much every one of our meetings that we have to give us a an update of what's happening with the department. So um, thank you again for joining us in this time. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, being here for a few minutes. So Caitlin, go ahead. Feel free to uh, share what you have to share. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity to give these updates. Um, so as far as um, what's going on with the department, um, I'll start with Peace SNAP, which is the Max Benefits Program. Um, Missouri was approved again for the Max Benefits for November, and it will be our intention <clears throat> to request it again in December. So the uh, part of the requirement of requesting this program, and obviously all of this is completely in flux with a new, potentially a new presidential administration. So I will say everything I'm saying right now has an asterisk of potentially changing, but given the current circumstance, um, we will request December PSNAP. Um, but after that, unless the governor extends the, the Missouri state of emergency um, past December, <clears throat> we would not be eligible to request it again because that is a requirement that there be a state of emergency at the state level. So um, that is a little bit up in the air. Um, you know, kind of an ask would be, you know, as you guys have interactions with participants, you know, we're trying to figure out how to communicate that the last few months have not been normal. And I know that if and when this program goes away, that can be a really significant impact on in, on households budgets. And so trying to prepare people that that might not go, you know, that might not, it won't be forever, but we don't know how long it will be. And it's really, really hard timing wise, um, given all the moving parts to proactively prepare people for that change. My fear is really that we're gonna wake up one day and we're gonna be like, well, guess it's over because you know there's just a lot of pieces that have to fall into place to know and I, I do know that the department feels very strongly that you know if it's an option to request it if we meet those basic tenants we want to request it because we have um, you know heard from a ton of families that this program has mean, meant a lot to them and really given you know some breathing room in budget so we do want to request it as long as we're able but that does create the problem of not having advance notice of when the program might go away. Um, the other program that I was gonna, that I wanted to give an update on was PEBT, which is the program for children who um, are eligible for free and reduced lunch at school. We have still not received guidance um, from FNS on the latest iteration of this program. Um, I participated in a call with APHSA, gosh, maybe two weeks ago now, where states gave feedback to FNS on that program. 
um, in advance of getting guidance. I inquired through one of our congressional members um, last week, asked them to check with FNS to see if we could get an estimate on timeline. And all I got was it's coming later. So I don't have um, any good information on when that program might come out. I think the state is still extremely nervous that um, the administrative requirements of implementation could be insurmountable. Um, the last guidance that was put out on the program required you to certify down to the student level what their in-seat versus virtual program was in addition to um, you know, whether they were just free and reduced lunch eligible. And we know that um, in Missouri, there's no uniformity as far as in seat, out of seat um, learning. It's down to the school level. Uh, so there's just not a good way to do, it, it would be it would be an extremely big lift, not, not, not even just on the agency or not even primarily on the agency but on our schools to, to implement that if that's the guidance. So we're waiting to see what comes out, hoping that um, some relief is given on that front, but that's just kind of a question mark at this point. Um, yeah. So uh, one other thing I was gonna mention, um, we did receive word, you know, back in gosh, like May, in the spring, Missouri was approved to be a state offering online purchasing for SNAP households. At the time, um, Amazon and Walmart were the only approved retailers through FNS. I did hear this week that um, we have one additional retailer, Woods Supermarket, that is close to coming online. And then there are a few other retailers in the wings um, that have, have been working with FNS to be approved for that program, which is extremely exciting um, to offer that option in more communities. So um, as soon as we've got firm dates on um, some of that, the department will make an announcement so the public is aware. Uh, those, so those are the main um, food related updates I have. Um, so if anybody has any questions on those, I'm happy to answer them. So in terms of the PSNAP, um, Caitlin, um, advocacy from our front to the governor's office in terms of the state of Missouri, um, the, the state of emergency being called for January is something that we could do that would be towards the governor's office. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I I certainly don't know the thoughts of the governor's office, but given the way things are currently in the state, I would assume that, um, you know, there's still utilization of a number of programs that are reliant on that state of emergency. So my guess would be it's going to be extended, um, but I don't know. So certainly that's something you could, an ask you could make. Okay. Great. And, and Caitlin, is, is the... One month at a time thing, something that the federal government requires that we it can only is, ask for it month by month? It is extreme. It's extremely frustrating. Not only is it month by month, but you're not even allowed to ask for it until after the 15th of the month. Uh, so often we don't know. I mean, in October, for the month of October, we didn't find out until the month had already started that we were even approved. So um, you can't ask until after the 15th and then you can't submit to um, our, to Quest, our EBT vendor. You can't submit until after the first of the month. So individuals who receive their benefits at the beginning of the month don't um, receive it on the same, they still receive the same amount, but their max benefits load a different day because uh. of the timing of when we have to request um, put in that file to Quest. It's it's quite quite an ordeal. That that sounds like something we should talk to Senator Blunt and Senator Hawley's staffs about how how inconvenient that is both for the state and and for the clients who have to worry. Uh, you know, um, when when you're in strain like this, like so many people are, not knowing what the landscape is that you're dealing with, just and increases the chances of things like mental health disorders going up, you know? Uh, people need 
some facts to, to it, live with and some stability. Uh, it's just terrible. Yeah, it's very hard to for the for the um, you know for the state to communicate because I you know I manage our social media so I do answer questions every single month those, those first few days of when our max benefits going to load um, and it's just very hard to communicate well you know it will load on your normal day unless your normal day is like before the fifth and then it might load on your normal day or it might not load on your normal day and I have had conversations with Senator Blunt's office about the timing of. Um, requesting approval for the following month, especially I talked to them in October when it was, um, I mean, we weren't even allowed to apply, I think, until after the 20th, which was extremely frustrating. Um, so they, they, I have had some conversations with them on the timing of the program. Does anybody else Thanks, have any Kelly. other questions for Caitlin? Thank you so much, Caitlin, and I hope your little ones are feeling better. Thank you. And if anybody um, has any questions they think of, I'm going to drop off, but feel free to share my email in the chat. If anybody has questions, they can email me. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. All right. Um, let's move on to um, the next guest speaker that we have on our call today. Um, I chatted with Jen a month or so ago. Uh, she is with a company called Propel. Um, they have worked really closely with FRAC and other of the national advocates that we work with. Um, their company created a, an app called the Fresh EBT app. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about that and about some of the work that she's done um, with that app and doing surveys with some of the, the clients that they work with. So. Jen, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm really happy to be here with everyone this morning. Um, I was trying to figure out how to turn off my iMessages because I'm, I'm sure as everyone else on this call is involved in multiple text threads. Um, and I've successfully, successfully figured out how to do that. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I, I prepared a little bit of a presentation. So as Chris, oh, Christine, you're on mute. Yeah, hey, I think okay. I stopped sharing mine. So see if, if it can work for you now. Okay, great. I just wanted to, uh, to tee it up. And, and as Christine mentioned, we've been do we've been working with FRAC um, the last since March, we have been uh, doing surveys of SNAP households that use Fresh EBT in order to understand and hear directly from SNAP clients their experience of the pandemic. And I'm gonna be sharing um, a little bit about who we are and then about the survey work that we've been doing since March. Uh, and I'll uh, be talking about the our most recent survey uh, from October. So here we go, let's try this. Um, can everyone give me a thumbs up if they can see my screen? Great. Um, so as Christine mentioned, I worked for a social enterprise called Propel, and we build modern, respectful, effective technology that helps low-income Americans improve their financial health. And one of the principal ways in which we do that, oh, pardon me, is through uh, uh, our app called Fresh EBT, um, which allows anyone with a SNAP uh, or EBT card to check their EBT uh, balance using our app. Um, we currently serve about 4 million households across the country and over 100,000 SNAP households in Missouri. Um, the average age of the individuals using our uh, uh, Fresh EBT is about 36. 85% identify as female and 87% have one or more ch uh, children in the household. Um, we offer a number of features inside Fresh EBT that are aimed at um, extending the benefit uh, level as much as possible. I think ultimately the talking point there is that the benefit amount is often insufficient, but uh, uh, households that use Fresh EBT are able to extend their benefits two extra days uh, per month. Um, we offer a coupons feature, and then we also offer uh, a jobs feature where we work with local and national employers to make job applications mobile phone friendly. Um, 
But one of the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is our household pulse surveys that we've been conducting every month since March. Uh, we share these in a monthly webinar uh, in partnership with FRAC. And at the end, I'm I don't know that we've nailed down a date for November or December. I think there'll be one more before uh, before. January, um, and I'll be sure to get that information to you as soon as, soon as I have it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the methodology. So the way that we administer surveys is, is inside the Fresh EBT app. So when 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 Fresh EBT users open the app, they'll see a little um, a little uh, block of text that asks them to share their story. Um, it's a six minute survey and all the, all the uh, questions are multiple choice and no question is required. So it's all, um, it's all open response. Um, we do a random sample this month was uh, over 2,500 of the 4 million Fresh EBT users. And this survey was up inside Fresh EBT from October 1st through the 14th. So that was when the survey data was collected. And again, all respondents are EBT current EBT card holders. Um, I'm going to just give you a high level, um, a high level of like the October survey results. Um, so we found that over half of Fresh EBT app users said they have worked in 2020, but less than a third are working right now. 20% uh, of respondents hadn't received their economic impact payment, and only 8% of those reported being ineligible for the stimulus payment. Um, more people have moved permanently in the last in the past 30 days compared to the 30 days prior. 20% of Fresh EBT households have not decided whether or not they're going to vote in the November election. Uh, we, we are going to be doing follow-ups to that, but we don't currently have information that's still in flux. Um, and that challenges exist for all respondents, but are mainly exacerbated for families with school-age children. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about employment status. 31% um, of respondents are not, work, are not working but are looking for work. And so basically the, the large takeaway here um, is respondents who had been working prior to the pandemic continue to report high rates of un unemployment and underemployment. And over half of Fresh EBT app users said they had worked in 2020, but again, less than a third are working now. And that kind of tracks with what we've been hearing all along. Um, Few, fewer workers are reporting uh, losing, um, losing employment completely or having total work to pause, but 60 to 65% consistently report working less than prior to the pandemic. Um, and again, um, you, I, I can send this afterwards, so I, I'll, I won't belabor reading through all of the, uh, all of the stats here. Uh, Housing. So, more as as I mentioned, more people have moved permanently in the last thirty days compared to the thirty days prior. Um, we aren't seeing high instances of people reporting evictions, but we have seen people uh, report that they are moving. Um, in I would say before the first of the eviction moratoriums expired, like there was worry of evictions, but we haven't. In, at least in our survey data, we haven't seen what was termed the tsunami of eviction really starting to take place. But again, we are seeing more people permanently move in the past 30 days. Um, recently, uh, we partnered with the Kentucky Equal Justice Center to highlight a tool that helps tenants generate and send uh, emergency, uh, uh, the CDC declarations to their landlords in order to prevent eviction under the CDC's eviction order. Um, I'm still waiting on new numbers, but the numbers from two weeks ago since launching the tool, uh, we've launched it uh, inside Fresh EBT, not just in Kentucky, but across the country. Um, over 2,500 households have generated a declaration. And what this tool does is it, it creates an easier, easy mobile phone friendly form that where you just input your information, it then generates the declaration with all the appropriate language. And you either have the option to email it to your landlord or to print it and have it on hand in case you need to send it to your landlord. Um, this tool also really encourages uh, low income tenants to get in touch with their legal aid organizations. Because as we often know, the I think uh, 
these forms uh, are still a little bit in flux. It is a, a necessary tool to prevent eviction at this point, but it is, is indeed not enough as there are many loopholes, I think, that are being explored in various parts of the country. Um, so similar to past months, government support has helped, but a majority of the government interventions have expired with the exception, I think, of emergency allotment. And I really appreciated what Caitlin said earlier about this idea of breathing room, because we have heard that over and over and over again, as Judy from Oregon basically points out, I've gone on Medicaid, received the stimulus payment and the extra SNAP benefits and was able to pay off a large amount to PGE. This has given me a little breathing room. We hear this term over and over again, um, but on a, the extra $600 payment, the lost wages assistance, pandemic EBT. I know there were several states that did a second issuance. I don't believe Missouri did. I think, again, the guidance was insurmountable for most states. Um, but when these benefits were happening, they really made a big impact. And now that they have expired, um, it's leaving a lot of families in crisis. And so we asked if the government could help with one thing, 32% 30 reported help with rent, 27% reported help with utilities, and then 27% also uh, helped with food. Transportation went up about 2% uh, this last go round, but it's usually pretty low. Um, so again, as I mentioned, uh, families have had to make impossible choices in the past 30 days. And the, 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 the big takeaway here again is more support is needed, especially to cover everyday expenses. Um, 45% report eating less, 43% of respondents haven't paid a bill, 35% uh, have skipped meals and so on. Um, and 53% think that, mon that the money that they have on hand right now will last them one to two days. And 54% are running low or do not have the things that their household need like food and cleaning supplies. Um, and families seem disproportionately, families with children seem uh, to be disproportionately impacted as well. Even though they have reported to be working more, they are also more likely to have borrowed money or used credit to cover expenses in the last 30 days. They have skipped meals. They have three days of cash on hand or less, and they're running low on everyday items uh, and like household products and cleaning supplies and food. And they also report spending more than 200 to $300 a month on food, and that does not include their SNAP, WIC, or PEBT benefits. Um, so challenges for families with school-aged children are, have been exacerbated, we found. Um, but there's a lot of resilience too. Um, we've heard uh, from, from families in Missouri about the help that they have extended or the help that has been extended to them. Um, and I'll just read through these quickly. I've helped others with toilet paper or other essentials when I have had extra, Dawn from Missouri. A friend does everything she can for me, getting me around to the store and to the doctor's office. She declined to leave her name, but she is also from Missouri. My brother let me and my two children move in with him. I, Irica from Missouri. So we're seeing families really sort of, and families and communities really band together. But with in the absence of, of government supports, um, families are having to make impossible choices. And even in the face of all of that, people are helping each other out. Um, but again, I think, I think it beho uh, belabors the point that that government supports are, are still very much needed. And when they were in place, they made a big difference for families. Um, we, we have not posted the October survey results on our website yet. These are the ones from um, September. I will send uh, the link along that will have our October survey results that you can peruse at your leisure. And I think that um, we, have, we are putting the uh, the past survey results up as well, so you can do some comparison. Um, but with that, uh, thank you so much for, for having me today. I very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate in this call, and I'm happy to take any questions. I know that was kind of a lot. <laughs> so I know sometimes folks need a moment to sort of digest those numbers. And again, I'll follow up with all this information.
That's wonderful. Thanks, Jen, so much. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Jen, do you know how many folks from Missouri um, that you have data from? Are you able to segregate it by state? We we can, but again, so these are these are randomized, right, across all fifty states. Mm -hmm. um, I don't recall how many respondents we had from Missouri, but the one the the quote the direct quotes that I shared were a part of the survey, and usually we have uh, people respondents from all 50 states, but it's it's randomized. Uh, but I did, we do serve over 100,000 uh, SNAP households in Missouri. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking that that might offer us some data to share with legislators about why we need to do certain things. Um, have you ever I'm, asked, have you ever asked questions about the difficulty of the application process by any chance? So we have done individual surveys in states um, in partnership with nonprofits. Um, and we recently worked with uh, New Jersey and Minnesota and asked those questions, yes. Okay, good to know. And I'm happy to talk with you more about that later if that's something you'd like to explore. Yeah. This is Vicki, I'd like to uh, ask a question as well. Uh, if, do you have do you collect demographics such as how many people with disabilities in the household are receiving uh, or receive SNAP benefits the the ones who participate on your app? So we do a general demographics survey twice a year, and it's all self-reported. So um, I, our app does not collect any personally identifying information because we have pretty stringent data privacy policies. So we do these demographic surveys. Uh, the last one we did is in July. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't recall, but I can, I can follow up with you with that information. Thank you. Sure. Um, and my email is is here. So if anyone has additional questions, because again, I know that sometimes when you get hit with a wave of information, it can be hard to uh, make sense of it and then ask a question, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. There was a question in the chat, Jen. Um, Michelle was asking if you create one pagers with some of the compelling results from the survey. So that's right. So in our... Um, in our, on our website, there's also an option to download it as a PDF. Great, great, yeah. Wonderful. Well, if no one else has any questions, thank you so much, Jen, I really appreciate it. And I will be back in touch to get these slides um, to share with everyone and uh, make sure that they have the website and all of that so they can go and get some more information if they need it. Wonderful. Thank you, Christine. I really, I'm going to hang on uh, and, and stay for the rest of the call, but thank you very much. I very much Wonderful. appreciate the opportunity. Great. Thanks, Jen. Um, all right. Let me see if I can share my screen again. Christine, why don't you just let me do it since we have the oh, same slide. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd that, be very helpful, um, actually. Yeah, because that yep. way I won't have to say change to the next slide yeah. for me, Christine. <laughs> that would be very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, and JMO is going to talk a little bit about um, some of the state updates um, with the election and COVID and things of that nature. So um, JMO, go ahead and share your screen and we'll just move on from there. Okay. Well, the, the first thing I'm going to share with you is um, we, you know, we had an election on Tuesday, as you're probably aware. And so uh, we're starting to figure out some things about what our next legislative session will look like. And there were elections in the, the House uh, Majority and Minority Caucuses uh, on Wednesday and uh, Thursday. So we now know, we already knew that Rob Vescovo, the former Majority Floor Leader, would be the Speaker of the House. Uh, and um, uh, there was a, a pretty hotly contested Majority Floor Leader race uh, with lots of people predicting it would be um, uh, Curtis Trent and other people predicting it would be Dean Plocker. Well, Dean Plocker 
from the St. Louis area um, uh, turned out to be the victor there. Um, I think this is somewhat favorable uh, to uh, the work that we want to do about hunger. And here's why. Uh, Curtis Trent was the sponsor of the work hour tracking requirements for Medicaid bill um, legislation that basically if you worked as much as the bill said you had to work, you'd make more money than you can make and get Medicaid in the state of Missouri until we won the changes in August with the, the ballot measure amendment two. Um, so he didn't quite understand, I guess, that we had such bad earnings rules in Missouri that you, could, you couldn't make more than like $300 a month and get Medicaid. And so people were in this horrible coverage gap if they were workers with low incomes. So Trent, uh, Curtis Trent did not win the majority floor leader, Dean Plocker did. And you may recall, if any of you went to the, the uh, exhibit that we did with Mazone, a Jewish response to hunger a couple or three years ago at a synagogue in West County, uh, West St. Louis County. We had a This is Hunger big semi-trailer truck exhibit uh, that was a very interactive museum quality display about hunger. Dean Plocker uh, co-led the effort to get legislators to go to with that, go to that. He's a Republican. Uh, Jill Shoup uh, is a Democrat from the Senate. The two of them uh, urged uh, St. Louis area legislators to, to come out to it. And we had all oh, around a dozen legislators come out and go to the This is Hunger uh, display. So Dean has some uh, history uh, of caring about hunger and working with us uh, on the issue. So this may be a somewhat good thing. Um, uh, this, the speaker pro tem continues to be a representative Wyman as was true before. Uh, the assistant majority floor leader will now be a representative Hannah Kelly. Uh, Representative Kelly sponsored a work hour tracking bill about SNAP in the past, but stopped doing it after we had some visits with her, not just us, but other folks. So I think she's, she shows that she's somewhat educable on that issue. Uh, and she's a really caring person. Um, uh, I went to visit her in her home district and found her caring for a foster child uh, that had, had come out of a horrible you know, uh, home situation, abuse and ne neglect kind of situation. And here she was uh, with a kid on her lap that wasn't her kid. And I was just really touched by uh, you know, what she was trying to do there to make a difference in, in the life of children. Uh, so she's somebody who puts her body where her mouth is on issues that she works on. She and I may not always agree about, agree about policy uh, solutions, but anytime somebody's willing to take in foster kids and provide them love, it's a very positive sign. Um, the caucus chair will be Representative Sarah Walsh, the caucus secretary, uh, Representative Kelly, Ann Kelly. This is former uh, Representative Mike Kelly's wife. Uh, Mike is now working over on the Senate side for Senator White. Uh, and then caucus whip uh, is uh, Representative Alan Andrews. Uh, Representative Andrews has shown a lot of interest in, in hunger issues in the past. Uh, he and I have uh, uh, talked about that and, and his wife, he and his wife are involved in um, uh, food drives for a local food pantry. Uh, so um, that's maybe some positive news as well. Over on the minority side, uh, Crystal Quaid consider, can, continues to be the minority floor leader. Uh, the new assistant minority floor leader is Representative Richard Brown from the Kansas City side of the state. Uh, caucus chair uh, will be Representative Ingrid Burnett. Uh, Ingrid is one of our champions on criminal justice uh, matters. She sponsors a uh, juvenile right to counsel bill. Uh, that's one of our priorities. Uh, caucus Vice Chair, Representative Lakeisha Bosley from the St. Louis side. Uh, caucus Secretary, Representative Gretchen Bangert from the St. Louis side. Caucus Whip, Representative uh, Doug Clemens. Uh, and then the, uh, the Caucus Policy Chair is Representative Unsicker. Uh, I called down to House Communications yesterday to say, is there a policy person for the Republicans yet? Uh, because um, it was Representative Jeff, Jeff Messenger last year, but he's been termed out. And they couldn't find any record that they've elected somebody yet. So maybe that, that will happen a little bit later and we'll fill you in when, when they have a policy chair. <clears throat> policy chairs generally just help the legislators get smart about the bills that are uh, before them and do things like invite special groups in like us to give briefings on, on things at times. So they're a good person to get to know. Um, Let me share now, uh, continue with the slides that we were on.
Okay, well, we're back at the beginning. Let's slide along here. I need to go back one. I am not an expert on how to get to this stuff. <laughs> There we go. All right, so this is the slide that I wanna be on is this one here. Let me see if I can actually get it where you can see that one. There we go. Um, so um, I think when I say reading view, it's gonna take us back to the beginning, maybe, yep, it did. <laughs> So let me click through more slowly this time. Here we go. So uh, big concern for us. Um, uh, Feeding um, America has come out with their with a report in October, um, and uh, it it uh, reported that before the COVID nineteen crisis, more than thirty five million people, including eleven million children, lived in a food insecure household. Uh, and pre pandemic data reflected the lowest food insecurity rates that there'd been in twenty years. Uh, but the current crisis has reversed improvements. So you may know that in 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 the the latest uh, poverty report that that we work with Missouri Community Action Network on and uh, and uh, Missourians in Poverty on uh, that uh, that we've been seeing some decline in the food insecurity rate in Missouri, which is wonderful. Well, you can also track this in the food uh, food food atlas from the University of Missouri uh, Columbia. Uh, we were at 12 percent in the the most recent report which was a little higher than the national average of 11.7. Um, uh, so we were headed in the right direction. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, because of the pandemic, the terrible situation that we're in, um, Feeding America projects uh, that uh, the annual unemployment rate uh, is apt to be 10.5% and the annual poverty rate 14.4% uh, overall and 20.1% among children. Uh, which would mean that one in six people in the United States, 50 million, including one in four children, 17 million children will experience hunger insecurity, food insecurity in 2020. That would raise our Missouri rate from 12% to 16.4%. We uh, have been doing some reports periodically with the Coalition on Human Needs in DC, co-releasing uh, data about what the, uh, the US Census Household Pulse Survey shows uh, and we know that uh, uh, that the COVID-19 diagnoses have been going up in Missouri, that we're having some capacity issues at our hospitals uh, and um, uh, it's, things aren't improving there. Uh, and, and we're headed into a winter that, that many you know, project uh, will be a real challenge. 40% of Missouri households had reported a loss of income since March. Uh, and in those households, 22% reported that they did not have enough to eat. 13% uh, reported that they were unable to pay rent, uh, and there was a huge racial disparity in how that data um, turned out. Uh, it was 40% of uh, Latinx uh, households and 20% of um, Black households that said they could not uh, pay rent. Um, I talked to two of the Missouri food banks uh, this week, uh, one on the east side, one on the west side, to see what are you seeing on the ground there and what are you hearing? Uh, and I did this partly because I was giving a report uh, on um, on Wednesday for the um, the the access and functional needs committee, a subcommittee of the governor's faith-based response to disaster committee, uh, and um, I wanted to be able to tell them what's really going on. Uh, both. Both groups reported they were seeing an increased demand of about 40% and that that level of demand was happening despite what Jen described. There's, there's been all of this help, right? There's been the, the higher, uh, the PEBT, um, uh, the maximum benefits program that Caitlin talked about earlier. There was the extra $600 uh, unemployment checks that expired and then we had some $300 uh, check uh, uh, in increases, unemployment checks for a period. In Missouri, those have now expired. There was the stimulus check. Most people have spent those, and and uh, and um, uh, 
the, there has not been new relief passed at the federal level. Um, there's also some talk of donor fatigue that they saw some increased uh, giving at the beginning, uh, but it had somewhat fallen off. I think a lot of people have been uh, living with a lot of anxiety, partly because this election cycle, we've just had this constant uh, forecast of doom and gloom and with you know, constant um, political ads that tell us the world is falling apart and it's, it's hard for our brains to do too many things at once. And a lot of people just been worrying, uh, I think, uh, maybe now that the election is over and also the holiday season for whatever reason makes people think about hunger a little bit more maybe the donors will pick back up. And uh, that's certainly a hope. And one of the reasons that we have these calls is to get people to think about how do we encourage more local charity and how do we encourage sound evidence-based public policy. You need both of those things to, to address something as big as hunger. Um, and then there used to be more excess in the retail system where people could pick up things from, from stores. Uh, but uh, that's uh, dropped off because of how people are shopping. A lot of people are are having food delivered to their houses and grocery stores are doing things a little differently than they used to. Uh, and then community food drives are dropping off too because people are afraid to go out and interact with each other face to face uh, to have things like a community food drive. Um, uh, a final issue uh, that was described to me is that in the past, the commodity system has been able to get some things. Uh, the example that was given to me is, uh, let's say farmers had an excess of green beans the government could buy those green beans and get them canned and ship them to the food banks. But right now there's been some shortages of aluminum because people aren't buying so much fresh, they're buying canned things. And people aren't drinking so much alcohol at bars from a tap, they're, they're drinking at home. Uh, and it's causing aluminum shortages and a different kind of resource barriers. So there are many challenges uh, for us uh, just now. Uh, um, and even, the, the reorganization of the Family Support Division uh, to its modern business plan that happened in 2013, it, it does create barriers for some folks who uh, don't have easy access to being online, uh, don't have, uh, there are parts of the state that, that don't have good, uh, good Wi-Fi. Uh, many of those that have low literacy levels and, and uh, don't get good paying jobs because of, of educational deficits uh, or intellectual disabilities also are intimidated about using computers and haven't been taught how to use them. So uh, there may be some people that need help that don't know exactly how to get that right now. And if there aren't face-to-face -face places that they can go to have somebody uh, partner with them to, to figure out how to, to access help, uh, they, there may be some real uh, dangers around that. Uh, some folks are just afraid to go out if they have pre-existing conditions, say they have uh, diabetes, Coronary, coronary artery disease, et cetera, uh, you hear how much worse the outcomes are. If you get COVID and you've got something already going on with your health, it may make you not want to go out and, and seek help either at a food pantry uh, or at, uh, at a helping agency that could, you don't have a computer at your house, you don't have Wi-Fi at your house, so you're going to have to go somewhere like to the community action agency and have somebody help you uh, apply for th something like SNAP. Uh, and um, you, you may be afraid to do that uh, for what it might do to your health. Uh, people with disabilities, Missouri is, has an outdated, unfair, and inadequate revenue system, and uh, we've repeatedly uh, cut home health as a way to help balance our state budget. So lots of people with disabilities may not have the support they need to access either charity in the local community or help from the state. And there's still a lot of stigma about asking for help uh, many people are just too too proud to reach out. Um, so there are real challenges here around dealing with the amount of hunger that we're having. And unfortunately, U.S. Senate Leader McConnell has resisted passing a new robust package of, of help. We know that the, the Congress uh, has passed one, uh, but uh, the House of Representatives has, but the Senate has not. And um, you know, just now, lots of people are projecting that we're going to have a divided Congress with a a democratically led House and a, a Republican led Senate. Uh, that could mean there'll be gridlock. Uh, we've certainly seen a history of that since about at least the 1990s. That's when I remember uh, just all out wars happening uh, from the, the different sides of the aisle. Uh, maybe it had been that way sometimes earlier in US history, but I certainly started to notice a change in how that looked in around 1994. 
Um, so uh, we could have gridlock or perhaps something about this election. Um, maybe the fact that Biden and McConnell have worked together for a long time. If Biden becomes our president, uh, uh, who knows how this is all gonna turn out exactly, but there might be more cooperation around things like nutrition assistance and the other aid that states so badly need. So uh, Christine, I'm gonna stop sharing uh, the screen there so that you can uh, talk about those issues. But before we turn it over to Christine to talk about federal issues, um, I wanna ask you, um, uh, is there a bill that any of your organizations are planning to go to the legislature about this year? Uh, or is there administrative advocacy that you're, they're all, you're already undertaking that we can help you perhaps, you know, part, this, this coalition can partner with you uh, in the past, we've seen some members of this coalition uh, pursue things like um, there, there, some, some of you all have testified in favor of uh, the bill that led to um, uh, vouchers for senior citizens who had low incomes to get fresh fruits and vegetables from farmers markets. If you remember that legislation that did pass and is still, you know, they're still working on implementing it better in our state. Uh, there's been uh, some challenges, but some successes. Uh, there's a bill to do that for people on WIC to help help those on WIC get vouchers for farmer's markets. There was legislation to, to, uh, um, to help with breakfast after the bell, but also some challenges about that. So um, uh, the, the legislator that sponsored that legislation has moved into other government service at this point. So she won't be there to sponsor that bill. Uh, but um, and there we've seen bills to simplify the application process for SNAP in the past and Representative Mary Elizabeth Coleman is returning uh, as a legislator from Jefferson County and is still interested in that issue. Is there something you're working on that you want to tell us about so that we can think about making that a priority issue for the coalition and not just legislation, but also advocacy that you want to be doing with the Department of Social Services? Okay, well, we, we will, uh, our staff is actually having a meeting next week to think through some of our priorities. Um, some of the ones that, uh, if you read the morning, um, the morning weekly perspective column, we do a Friday email blast that includes a blog from somebody every week. This, this, this week I wrote uh, as the, the director of policy and organizing uh, on sort of the outcomes of the elections. Uh, and, and one of the things that I said is basically Missouri did a lot of damage uh, to our, our safety net in uh, 2015 with the passage of Senate Bill 24. Um, many of those things that are in that bill got suspended because of the emergency that we are in. And we need to make, make sure that, um, that those damaging rules are not applied until our state is fully in recovery, uh, established recovery. Uh, I don't mean like the day that the emergency order ends, everything goes back to like it was, we, we need unemployment to drop. Uh, we need, uh, you know, um, uh, communities to recover. We need people that have accumulated debt on things like their rent and their utilities to have got that paid down by relief uh, before we would impose any harsh rules again. Those harsh rules were a, a mistake to begin with. They were based on the premise that somehow $4 a day worth of of, of help from the food stamp program lures people into just staying home on their couch watching TV all day and and that you can't you can't get people that have low incomes to, to look for work which is not the truth uh, those that law was built on myths and stereotypes unfortunately but did pass in our state uh, and uh, and Governor Nixon vetoed the bill and then the legislature overrode his veto uh, in order to impose that on our state and we've seen, tens of thousands of people lose access to food stamps because of, of that law. Uh, so um, we need to make sure that, that those harsh rules are not imposed during a pandemic and that they aren't imposed again. I don't want them ever to be imposed again, but if we can't stop that, we need to at least get into solid recovery uh, before those things are imposed. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that we probably will be uh, working towards board uh, is, is uh, well as trying to simplify the application process. So um, we will keep you posted on that. Uh, Christine, I will uh, hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Jamo. Um, 
just in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to talk through a couple of the federal updates that have come down um, over the last couple of weeks or so. Um, there have been two updates that have been ruled through the courts. Um, over the last year and a half or so, um, the administration on the federal level has tried to um, change a couple rules within the implementation and the administration of um, our, some of our safety net programs. So a judge just issued an injunction to block one of the rules that they tried to put forth regarding the ABODs um, and the work requirements. So individuals who do not have children who are on the food stamp program have a time limit and work requirements to keep accessing that program. Um, there was a way for counties to waive um, those requirements if they had a certain level of um, unemployment. And the administration tried to pass a, um, a rule change that would not allow different counties or would re significantly reduce the unemployment numbers um, for those um, work requirement rules to be waived. Um, we submitted comments against this rule change and a judge just ruled an injunction to stop that uh, rule change from taking place. So that is a very positive move um, that we uh, supported. Uh, we support um, that injunction that he just sent down. Um, another um, judge had just ordered um, to vacate a policy that the Trump administration had tried to pass regarding what they call the public charge rule. Um, and this related to um, legal immigrants who are coming into the United States, um, mostly on green cards or permanent residency. They were going to have a rule change that, that pretty much was going to be putting forth some sort of a wealth test, saying if, if an individual had a possibility or a chance that they would have to be on some sort of a safety net program, they would be denied a green card or um, permanent resident status based on that. Um, that not only um, we disagree with, but it also had a horrible chilling effect for all immigrants um, who were on safety net programs. There was a huge drop off um, for individuals um, being on some of our safety net programs because they were concerned about their immigrant status because of that. Uh, we also submitted comments against this rule um, and we're happy to report that a judge just ordered um, the, that policy change. Um, so those, both of those federal updates through the court system have been positive and we hope that they will stand uh, moving forward. Um, and then just an election update. We know there's still a lot of things up in the air. The one thing that we do know on the Missouri front is that we do have one new US representative um, with Cori Bush um, taking over Lacey Clay's state seat here in the St. Louis area. Um, once she officially takes office, she will have local staff and DC staff set up. We will be doing a lot of outreach to her office um, and begin establishing relationships with those staff members who work on the agriculture and um, hunger issues, as well as her local staff um, to introduce um, them to us and the work that we do and to build relationships to work towards some changes and some action that she can support us in DC on. Um, I was on a food research and action center, um, which is our national partner on a lot of this work um, yesterday. Um, at that point, I think the outcome of the presidency was even a little more uncertain. Um, but what they said was, as always, our priorities are going to be the same, no matter who is in the presidency, the work that we do is going to be the same. Our goals are going to be the same. The way we go about doing that may be a little different, but our, our goals are always going to be the same. Um, so just a few bullet points under that is that we will always and continue to work on some food and nutrition assistance, especially in this pandemic time. We will continue to make safety net programs stronger and access easier. And looking into 2020, um, child nutrition reauthorization may be on the table. And that is the policy that reauthorizes all of the school meals and the summer meals and out of time, out of school time meals, along with the WIC program. So there's going to be a lot of advocacy that's going to have to happen in the next year or so on that front. Um, so we will look to doing some work with our Congress people and our senators on child nutrition reauthorization in 2020. Anyone have any questions on any federal um, updates at this point? All right. 
Um, that is pretty much the bulk of the agenda that I had. Um, we will be having um, a food security coalition call every month. We've settled on at this point, um, the first Friday of the month at 9 a.m. So the next one will be on December 4th. Um, that is right after um, the filing for state level policies goes into effect. Legislators on the state level can start filing bills on December 1. So we would imagine that we will have quite a list to start talking about and looking at on December 4th. Um, so we will begin to look towards the 2021 Missouri legislative session on that call. And so if you're available, please join us. We will have some updates on the Missouri level. I would imagine we'll have some updates on the federal level as well. <laughs> And Christine, I, I put down in the chat box a link where people can read a guide to the newly elected people in the House. Great. This was put together by the group called Mo Scout, and so uh, it's a, a handy little guide that lets you know, uh, you know, who the person is, a little mini bio of them, who they're replacing, like who had the seat before them, uh, and some contact information for them. So one of the things we're going to want to do is introduce ourselves to all of these new people, help them know what our agenda is, what, how we can be helpful. Uh, and uh, and start start to get to know them. So that's one of the things about term limits is we have to build new relationships constantly in the state of Missouri. Yes, um, Jamo, if you want to talk a little bit about our racial equity summit as well, that would be great. Sure. Um, we knew that no matter who got got elected, just like Frack is like we always work for the same thing. Uh, that uh, people get confused sometimes and think that the election is the show and like who gets elected is is like it. But it's not, it's not about people that get elected, it's about the movements that we build for, for social justice uh, that, that, uh, that, that's the, the thing that can make, uh, make stuff happen. Uh, and, and those in office can help us, but we have to build the movement to get them to cooperate with us. So uh, we wanted to make sure that right after the election, we had an event that gathered everybody together and said, here's what we can do. Uh, and one of the things that became so clear over the last year uh, is that we are not doing um, uh, well uh, in around racial equity. Um, when it comes to who lost jobs in the pandemic, who lost income, who can't pay their rent, uh, who, is, uh, who has the highest rates of, of food insecurity, there are terrible uh, racial inequities there, uh, disparities uh, that have uh, black folks and Latinos, uh, much higher, higher rates of all of those challenges, higher rates of getting COVID, higher rates of dying from COVID, um, so, um, and not to mention all that we, we saw this last year around um, uh, a disproportionate use of force uh, by police departments, uh, unnecessary deaths like uh, George Floyd, et cetera. So we wanted to make sure that people knew that there were places to plug in for racial justice right after the election was over, that the, 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 the election, it's not like we can just put up our feet and wait for four years till the next presidential election for something. There's work that needs to be done right now. We've invited Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson to be the keynote speaker for this on uh, November the 20th. Uh, he is a pastor, a philanthropist. He's worked at Deaconess Foundation. Uh, uh, he's uh, a thought leader nationally on racial justice. He's moving from the Deaconess Foundation to the Children's Defense Fund succeeding the amazing Marion Wright Edelman, who's a, someone that I just adore uh, as an advocacy uh, role model. Uh, he's also board chair for the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy and vice chair of the Forum for Theological Exp Exploration. So you can find some information uh, about uh, him on our website. Christine, why don't you show your final slide about how people can get in touch with you and then stop sharing and I'll, I'll show people something from our website real quick. Okay, so it's Christine at EmpowerMissouri.org if you want to get in touch with Christine. Um, on, our, on our website, you can find information about this event. Uh, and I just wanted to um, let you know that uh, um, you can, uh, if, if you go to the events tab and pick uh, the Racial Equity Summit, you'll see all the information about it. At the bottom, you'll see how to register. Registering is free. And the reason registering is free is because of this. Um, Maxine Clark and Bob Fox and the Deaconess Foundation became platinum level co-sponsors for this event to cover all the costs of having it and that allows us to let you register for free. Now when you register you will be offered the chance to donate to us and we hope that you will choose to do that because we need to be good and strong 
uh, to keep uh, our work at the maximum level that we can, uh, especially during this time of pandemic, uh, when poverty is so high, when food insecurity and housing insecurity are such challenges to survival. Um, so uh, those folks have uh, become platinum level uh, sponsors, but others have, are joining us. I just wanted to point out goal level co-sponsors, Missouri Budget Project, Women's Voices for Social Justice, uh, Women's Voices Race for Social Justice, the Jewish Community Relations Council, Beyond Housing, Operation Food Search. They're on the call today. Thank you, Operation Food Search, uh, Missouri Kids First, the Salvation Army, Places for People, uh, and then silver level co-sponsors, Chestnut Health Systems, Physicians for a National Health Plan, Gateway Housing First, More Squared, uh, and then uh, bronze level co-sponsors, Mothers of Incarcerated Sons and Daughters and Kelly J. Berry. Uh, there's uh, more and more uh, folks signing on. I got some more in the mail yesterday. Sterling Bank will be added to this list. Um, so uh, you can become a co-sponsor if you click at the bottom of that page. It will take you to this fact sheet about what the levels of co-sponsorship are and what you need to do to become a co-sponsor. So we hope that you'll consider that. Uh, co-sponsors get to make a pitch at the end of the program of here's what we're doing and how you can get involved. Uh, and it's a way to mobilize people into efforts that will matter. So we hope that you will help us make this a huge success. We already have about 200 people registered to attend. And I believe we can get to 500 if we all work on it. Because a lot of people don't sign up till the end for these things, right? <laughs> the fact that we're at around 200 now, this early in the process, is really, uh, really exciting. So uh, let's make this a huge event. We, we have contracted with a firm that can help us do a, an event with 1,000. Let's get to 1,000. Wouldn't that be a great goal? Invite your friends and neighbors. Uh, post the link for this in your, in your social media and invite them to sign up for this Racial Equity Summit. Uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Wilson will not disappoint you. Every time he has ever, I've ever heard him speak, you know, I grew up in a Baptist church, so I wanted to say amen is what I wanted to do. Uh, he is a, an amazing speaker. So uh, help us reach a thousand people at this racial equity summit. Wouldn't that be good for our state? Any questions for me? All right, okay. thanks Christine. for demo. Um, okay. like, I, like Jamo said, my email is christine at empowermissouri.org. If you have any questions or any follow-up, um, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, otherwise, we will come back together um, at the beginning of December and, and look towards 2021. Thank you all so much. Have a good day.